But we're in this series going through the book of Joshua, and we're talking about what it means to be in the middle. For the Israelite people, they have uh, left slavery in Egypt. They'd wandered in the desert for 40 years, um, but they're not into the land that God had promised them yet. They're in that middle time, and we as people can be in the middle as well, when we go through hard times and difficult times and pain and uncertainties, we just don't know what the next day even looks like. And, and we're wondering, why aren't we where we, we should be? This is really where they are, and they're teaching us things as we walk through this series on what it means to be when we go through the middle. And um, what we've seen so far, though, is, is that Israel has entered into the promised land, finally. Joshua has led them in. They've come across the Jordan River. God stopped the water. They walked across on dry land and entered into the promised land. We see they have victory at Jericho. And then because of one man's sin, Achan, uh, he took some of the things that were meant to be devoted to God or devoted to destruction. He took them for himself. In doing so, the sin caused failure at the next place, I, and then last week we saw that once that the people of Israel dealt with the sin in the camp in their lives, uh, there was victory at Ai. And so two cities now within the promised land have come down, and we begin to see like there's this anxiety amongst all of the other uh, people groups and cities that within the promised land. And so that's where we are. Let me ask you a question to kind of get rolling here this morning. Have you ever been deceived by someone, lied to? Have you ever gotten burned by somebody, by somebody who just seemed really sincere, you trusted them, and it turned out that they were lying to you the whole time, and they took advantage of you? Those are in the middle times too, dealing with that. And I think sadly most of us can relate to that all too easily. We've placed our trust in someone and they offered uh, us their word, and then we've been hurt and disappointed by what happened and as a result of it. Well, the story that we're going to be looking at today from Joshua chapter 9 shows what happens here with Israel when they've been deceived and how they handled this whole situation. So let's just start, and if you have a Bible, we're going to read Joshua, 1, or Joshua 9, starting in verse 1. We'll read a little bit. If you don't have a Bible, you can just listen along. <clears throat> but it says in verse 1, as soon as all the kings who were beyond the Jordan in the hill country and in the lowland all along the coast of the great sea toward Lebanon, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites heard of this, they gathered together as one to fight against Joshua and Israel. So all of these different groups of people they're like, we, we've seen what they've done. They're coming into the promised land. We, we've heard that God has promised this land to them. They're coming in. And remember, as we talked about way back, uh, these people are people that have, have uh, ignored God, and God is, is judging them now. And they're not, they don't want to turn to him at all. And so they, they hear that they're coming, so they're like, what we got to do? We got to do something. Let's all band together, and we'll try to stop Israel and see what happens. And, but it, there's one, and we're going to see here this in a second, there's one place that decides, that's not the plan for me. We're not going to do that. I'm not going to join in with all of these other cities. That's not the plan, best plan for us. We're not going to align with all of them because we don't think that's going to work either. So what we're going to do is, is these people, they're called the Gibeonites. They try this different plan. And what they try to do is they try to make a treaty, a peace treaty with Israel. They also realize that the Israelites aren't going to make a treaty with them. So they know that the plan of the Israelites as commanded by God is to go in and take the whole land. So they come up with this different plan and how to make a treaty with them. They decide to look like they have come from a faraway land. Look at verse 3. <clears throat> It says, but when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and to Ai, they on their part acted with cunning and went and made ready provisions and took worn out sacks for their donkeys and wineskins worn out 
and torn and mended, with worn out patched sandals on their feet and worn out clothes. And all their provisions were dry and crumbly. And they went to Joshua at the camp of Gilgal and said to him and to the men of Israel, we have come from a distant country, so, make, so now make a covenant with us. So this is what they do. That's their plan to try to trick them into making a treaty with them. All to fool them. All to gain their trust so that they can do this. Now, we're told in the book of Exodus and the book of Deuteronomy that they were not to make any treaties with any of the people inside of the land that God had promised them. They could make treaties with those outside of that land, but not with those inside. And so the Gibeonites say, you know, hey, we're not near you. We're not neighbors in this land here. We aren't, we aren't part of it. And so if you want proof, look at our clothes. Look at our food. Look at our wineskins. Look at our sandals. They're all worn out. We've come from a faraway land, and we need your help. Will you make this treaty with us? And so I think that it's, it's, it's interesting here that the people of Israel don't know this, but the writer of the book of Joshua wants to make it very clear to his readers that they were not to make this treaty with the people. It would be wrong for them to do that. Verse 7 says, But the men of the Israel said to the Hivites, Perhaps you live among us. Then how can we make a covenant with you? And you may be saying, Wait a second. I thought they were the Gibeonites, not the Hivites. Well, the author is showing us very clearly here that they're not from a faraway land. They're actually neighbors here, and they were not to make a treaty with them. That's what he's trying to show. And so, they know that they weren't to make a treaty with that people from anyone in the land that God had promised them. So they ask, how do we know for sure that you are not from this land? How do we know that you're, 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 you're tr tricking us? How can we trust you? How can we make this treaty if you are part of this land? And verse 8 tells us, they said to Joshua, we are your servants. And Joshua said to them, who are you and where do you come from? And they said to him, From a very distant country your servants have come because of the name of the Lord your God. For we have heard a report of him and all that he did in Egypt and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon, the king of Heshbon, and to Og, king of Bashan, who lived in Astra. Now, if you remember, which you may not, but you might, this is the same wording that Rahab said to the spies when the spies went in to look at Jericho. Same wording that Rahab said. And it continues in verse 11. And it says, So our elders and all the inhabitants of our country said to us, Take provisions in your hand for the journey and go to meet them and say to them, We are your servants. Come now, make a covenant with us. Here is our bread. It was still warm when we took it from our houses as our food for the journey on the day that we set out to come to you. But now, behold, it is dry and crumbly. These wineskins were new when we filled them, and behold, they have burst. And these garments and sandals of ours are worn out from the very long journey. So what the Gibeonites are doing, they're just pouring it on them right here, right? They say the, those very same words that Rahab said, and Rahab uh, protected the spies in Jericho, and uh, they were the only ones that were able to come out free from Jericho, Rahab and her family. And that's the words that she used to them. And, and they say also, we have all of this proof that we are from a faraway land. Look at all of our things. All these things were new when we left, and now they're all falling apart. We have to be, we must be from a faraway land. We aren't from around here. And then we start to see the problem in this whole situation. It's in verse 14. And it says, So the men took some of their provisions, but did not ask counsel from the Lord. They look at all of these, these guys' things, all their provisions, and they listen to what they're saying, but they never asked God about this situation. They never said, God, what do you want us to do? They rely on their own strength. They rely on their own wisdom. And they fail in every way to even think about, maybe we should ask God about this situation. What would God say about it? And so verse 15 tells us what happens. 
It says, And Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them live. And the leaders of the congregation swore to them. So they make this decision. They make this treaty with these people. And oftentimes, when we make bad decisions, it doesn't take very long for us to find out the result of that, right? Have you noticed that in your life? You make a bad decision, it's not very long. Like, oh man, I really messed up on this one. Like we see this here in verse 16, because three days go by. Three days, that's it. Three days go by, and this is what happens. Verse 16. At the end of three days, after they made a covenant with them, they heard that they were their neighbors and that they lived among them. And the people of Israel set out and reached their cities on the third day. Now their cities were Gibeon, Chepera, Chepera, I maybe pronounced that one, I'm sorry, and Beeroth, and Kirith Jerem. So they go out and they're going to the next area. They get three days down the road and they come to this place and they're like, hey, wait a minute. Didn't we just see you three days ago? Didn't you just tell us you're from a faraway journey, you know, a faraway place, not a three-day journey by walking from where we were? What's going on? You lied to us. And so as they make their way, they, they, you know, they probably they look at Jericho and they see it in ruins, and they look at Ai and they see it at ruins, and they come to these four cities here and they expect the same thing to happen there, and, and they should be doing, the, you know, what God had called them to do, and here they are. Here are these people. Look at verse 18. <clears throat> but the people of Israel did not attack them because the leaders of the congregation had sworn to them by the Lord, the God of Israel. Then all the congregation murmured against the leaders. But all the leaders said to all the congregation, we have sworn to them by the Lord, the God of Israel, and now we may not touch them. This we will do to them. Let them live let wrath be upon us because of the oath that we swore to them. And the leaders said to them, let them live. So they became cutters of wood and drawers of, draw, drawers of water for all the congregation, just as the leaders had said of them. So they get there to attack and they can't. And the people ask, why aren't we doing this? And Israel says, you know, we can't because we made a treaty with them. The leaders of Israel said this. And so this passage is showing us that they actually made a mistake in making this treaty. They shouldn't have done this. And we, they say to the people, we can't go back on the oath that we have sworn to them. So they make them workers for the people of Israel. It goes on, verse 22. We're getting somewhere with this, so hang with me. <laughs> it says in verse 22, Joshua summoned them and he said to them, why do you deceive us, saying, we are very far away from you when you dwell among us? Now, therefore, you are cursed, and some of you shall never be anything but servants, cutters of wood, and drawers of water and the ha for the house of God. They answered Joshua, Because it was told to your servants for a certainty that the Lord your God had commanded his servant Moses to give you all the land and to destroy all the inhabitants of the land from before you. So we feared greatly for our lives because of you and did this thing. When I mean, you look at this, right, they, they, they weren't wrong in what they said to Joshua, right? This is what God had told the Israelites to do in this moment. They could have uh, aligned themselves, this, the, the Gibeonites could have aligned themselves with these other nations and tried to just go in a, and defeat Israel, but they said, they, we, we know that that wouldn't work, so why would we even try? That's why we lied to you. And it goes on a little bit more, verse 25. And now behold, we are in your hand. Whatever seems good and right in your sight to do to us, do it. So he did this to them and delivered them out of the hand of the people of Israel, and they did not kill them. But Joshua made them that day cutters of wood and drawers of water and for the congregation of the, and the, for the altar of the Lord to this day in this place that the, he, had, he should choose. Almost tongue twister there for me. So the outcome of all of this that's happened so far is that Joshua has them become their workers for Israel. And they tell Joshua that, yes, we lied to you so that we wouldn't be destroyed, and we know that you're here to take the land, that your God is with you. And verse 26 is a very, very interesting verse here. It tells us that Joshua delivered the Gibeonites out of the hands of the Israelites, and they didn't kill him. Like, what is this teaching the people? 
What's important about this whole passage here? What's the message for us even today? Like, what is God saying? Well, as we've been going through this book of Joshua, we've seen all of these pictures of redemption. They were in the middle. They weren't where God had promised them to be yet. And all the way, though, all the way through this, God is showing them that He is their Savior, that I have come, I'm here, I'm saving you. And for us, we see this picture of how God is going to save the world through Jesus, what He's going to do. And the thing that God is trying to show His people is, is the the danger here of judging by what you see. Like judging things by what you see. When you look at this story here, what happened with the Israelite people, everything that the Gibeonites do sounds right, it looks right, it feels right. And so they're, they're, they're listening to all this. They don't just come to the Israelite people and say, hey, we're from a faraway place, so will you sign this treaty with us? And Israel likes, okay, cool, let's sign it. That's not what happens here. Israel was very uncertain about this whole situation. We don't really believe that you're from a faraway land, and so you've got to prove it to us. How do we know? And the Gibeonites give them all of this proof that they're from a faraway land. They look at our clothes, look at our food. And we need to understand here that this is, that, that as uncertain as the Israelite people were with this situation, and even though they questioned uh, where the Gibeonites were from and what they were saying to them, they still end up making the wrong decision in this moment. They still don't do what God had commanded them to do. And so when we look at this, you know, in our lives, there's things that can look right, that can sound right, and can seem right, and still be completely and totally wrong. And we're really good at making decisions in our lives only by what we see. That's the wrong thing that the Israelites do here. They make the decision only by what they can see. And we can think about some of the the decisions that we have made in our lives that at the time it seemed right, it felt right, it sounded right, and it was completely wrong wrong. When we were first married, we had one of our cars go into the shop that was going to have major repairs. It was going to be there for a couple of months or three months, four months, something like that. It was going to take a while. Needed to order parts and all of these things. But that was okay because we had another car. But on the way home from taking that car to the mechanic, we had a bad snowstorm all that morning. And I was going around a turn at about 25 miles per hour, going as slow as I could. And that snow and ice just shot me and spun me right into a guardrail, and I totaled our other vehicle. Just like that, we're without the vehicle. Nothing. And to make a long story short, uh, somebody we, had, we didn't even know called me up in my office one day and said, Hey, I hear you need a vehicle. Uh, I've got one for you. I want to give to you. We're like, Okay, sweet, awesome. And so we get gifted this beautiful Lexus car. I mean, it looked blue when you were looking at it, but it had this special paint that when the sun hit on it, it was actually a sparkly green. It was this amazing car. We loved that car. It was so easy to drive. It was, it was fun. And so we had it for the first couple of years we were married. And uh, then we moved to Alaska, fly-in village. The only way to get your vehicle from where we were in Pennsylvania to there was on a barge. So we decided we didn't want to spend that, and they had a vehicle for us, so we decided we'd sell that car. We loved that car. It was so hard to say goodbye to it, but we did, and we went to Alaska, and we were in that fly in village for a while, and we came back to Pennsylvania for a short time before we were going to go to Toke, Alaska, where we were for six years. And in that short amount of time, we wanted a vehicle. And so we started looking for a vehicle, and we found another one, a Lexus, for sale in our price range. We're like, well, we love that one so much. Let's go take a look at this. And so we listened to what the guy had to say, and we looked at the car, and we thought, okay, this must be a good thing. And see, he says it's good. He's selling us all these things about it. And so we're going to get it. And we buy this car, and it was the worst car we ever had. I mean, we listened to this guy, and he told us all these things. We thought, all right, it's going to be fun. It was horrible. We put so much money into that car. I hated that car. As much as I loved that first one we were gifted, I hated that second one that we bought. 
and it just all fell apart. We were duped by what the, we, we saw and all of that, and we had to live with it. You know, and, and those things come back to bite us sometimes, and it happens quickly. And there are things that at times, they seem right at the moment, it seems like it's the right decision, and it must be the right way to go, and it turns out completely wrong for us. And what God is, wants and what he's always trying to do, he's trying to walk us through and teach us what we need to make the spiritual consideration about our decisions, about not making decisions by what sounds right and seems right all the time. One of the things that's hard for us is not to judge by what we see in our lives and not making decisions based just on the fleshly desires because it's hard for us not to believe what the writer of Proverbs says here. You see it on here. It's Proverbs fourteen twelve. There is a way that seems right to a man, but at the end, that way is death. For a lot of us, that's really hard for us to accept. We don't want to listen to that. I want to think that my wisdom and my judgment and my way of thinking is right. I want to believe that a lot of times. And God is over and over and over again coming to us and saying, your natural way of thinking will lead to spiritual death. Don't always go by what you see. Don't go by what seems right. Our senses and our flesh can lead the wrong way. And so we're in a war between the spirit and the flesh. And often... What we think is right is totally wrong. We've all could say that that's happened in our lives before. Sometimes the things that sound right are the wrong thing to do. And anytime we, I mean, you think about it this way, you could think about it, anytime we use our anger and our logic and our reasoning, we think we're doing it right. We think that it was a right display of emotions in that moment, that we're, we're vindicated because by our, even though we were in anger, by blowing up at someone because I was right in that situation. And even though we have every excuse and reason for us to blow up to somebody, it may not be the right thing. And what God wants us to know, it's something that he tells us over and over and over again, is don't use your heart or your logic or your minds as simply the basis for your decisions. Don't just use those things. There needs to be another basis. And it's not simply by what you see in life. It's not by, you know, what you think is right or seems right or feels right. And the big problem that we see here is that the Israelites just don't ask for God's direction. They just don't ask for it. They sampled the Gibeonites' provisions what did they do? They used what they saw, and it seemed right to them. That's failure one. Failure two is they never asked God. Why didn't they ask for God's direction? Why, why didn't they ask God what to do in this situation? What is your plan? What is your will in this situation, God? Why didn't they do that? And I, I want us to think for a moment here about this. Why don't we choose to ask God for his direction? Why don't we do it? I think it's usually because we feel like we have the answer to this situation. It's because we've already evaluated everything that's there. It looks right. It sounds right. It feels right. And so I don't need God's input in this situation. I've got it figured out. I don't need him. That's the very thing that this passage is warning against here. I know that it sounds right. I know that it feels right. I know it seems right. It looks right. So I don't need to ask God right now because I got it all figured out. We see this in the New Testament. Ephesians 4. <clears throat> says, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of heart. And what we do naturally is that we walk in the futility of our minds and we are darkened in our understanding. Our natural state is that we think that we have everything figured out and what we do is it you know, sounds right, it looks right, it seems right, and that's God saying that's the futility of our minds and the darkenedness of our understanding and it's not right, it may not be the right way to go. We need to talk to Him. And so often we make a mess of things because we don't seek God's counsel or God's direction in that situation. 
We make a mess of things because naturally our way of thinking is not God's ways. And if we do what sounds good to us, that's not going to be the spiritual way a lot of the time. And so our natural inclinations need to be changed. So how do we do that? How do we change that? How do we get ourselves man, to seek the counsel of God, to ask God what to do? How do we change our way of thinking? Well, if we're going to have a proper way of thinking and make decisions and know God's will and seek God's way, we need to know God's word. And the only way to change our futile thinking is to have God's word change our hearts and change our minds. We need a renewed mind, as Romans 12 says. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. This is what needs to happen for our way of thinking to be changed. There needs to be renewal of the heart and our mind and the way that we think. The Bible is the way that we do this. We come to the Word of God. And so that means that we have to learn to know who God is. We need to know Him more. (coughs) Excuse me. And it's disappointing how often God's Word can simply be presented as a list of instructions for us, like a bunch of do this and don't do that. And the reason why is you're going to encounter a lot of decisions in your life that you're not going to be able to open up the Bible per se and say, you know, what am I going to do in this moment? Like, should I move to Pennsylvania? Should I buy this car? Are we going to find the answer specifically for that in the Bible? That's not what God's Word is about, right? What we (coughs) learn—oh, excuse me, choking on myself there— What we learn from these stories, though, and through the poetry that's in the Bible and through the prophecies that we read in the Bible and through all the narrative is we learn the mind of God that we should have our minds be renewed so that we can become more into the image of what God is and be more like God in our thinking. That's why we read the Bible. That's why we take on the mindset and character of God. We come and we, we grab hold of that. And so if we're reading the Bible on a surface level, like say we're, as we're going through the book of Joshua, and we read through Joshua and we see, you know, what am I supposed to do now as I read Joshua? What is it telling me to do? Well, there, there aren't a lot of shall nots and shall do's, right? As you look at the book of Joshua, it's, and then you might think, well, I guess the book of Joshua is not very relevant to my life right now. But as we read the Bible, what we're learning is, is the mind of God. We're learning the ways of God. And it's important for us to come to the Bible in such a way that we're learning about God's character, about God's ways and what he's like. And then we're adopting those to ourselves, that we're able to consult God in that. Like we come to the Bible so that we can come to know him more. And then we also, (coughs) excuse me, need to talk to God more in prayer. And this, you know, there's, there's this, I mean, just think about the challenge of prayer. Think about that challenge. Why is prayer so hard, difficult? Well, it's, it's because prayer is, is, is such a thing that God has given us to be able to, to talk to Him, to know Him. And especially when we realize that we shouldn't make decisions on what sounds right, feels right, looks right. Here's God who knows all and sees all, and here's me in my limited view of life, which is very small, and I have the Almighty God who knows all things from the beginning to the end, and God is saying to us, come to me, talk to me about these things. Why don't we come to him more in prayer like that? Well, part of it is is that prayer requires believing God is actively answering prayers. Do we believe that God is active in our world and actively answering prayers? Do we believe that? Look at Revelation chapter 8. It says, When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. And then I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, and he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. 
Now, when you read the book of Revelation, there is a lot of imagery and symbolism in the book of Revelation. And, and maybe, I hope you see the, the imagery here in this, this little passage right here. The smoke of the incense was given as a symbol of the prayer of God's people entering into the throne room of God. Now, when you think about the, the, the tabernacle from the Old Testament, they had that, right? The altar of incense was right before the most holy place, and the smoke would go into the, to that room. But here in Revelation, we see that this is a picture of the prayer of God's people coming before the throne room of God, and that the prayers of God's people just don't simply hit the ceiling like when we're in a room, right? And then they're only there for our therapeutic good. But God himself, as we see this and read this, is receiving the prayers of God's people into his throne room. And it goes on in verse 5. It says, Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. And what do we see here, right? Like it's the prayers, they come into the throne room of God and God turns them into acts on the behalf of the prayers and sends them back down to the earth. And it's an amazing picture here of God saying, I am hearing your prayers and I'm responding on your behalf. And so consult me, talk to me, look for my guidance, listen for my direction. And when I think about the problem of prayer, I believe that self-sufficiency is really the death of prayer life. Self-sufficiency, that's what kills it. <laughs> it's when I stop becoming self-sufficient in my own life that I'm going to pray more and I'm going to seek God more in my life. Here is Joshua, and they've evaluated all of the evidence. They've got it all figured out. So I don't need God at this moment. I see the answer, and we do this in our own lives. I've looked at all the information. I know everything I need to know about this situation. And based on what I know and seems right at this moment, this is what I need to do. And so I don't need to pray and ask God because I've got it figured out. I can do this on my own. I don't have to ask God. We need to come to God more. We need to come to God more. Talking to Him about what's going on in our lives and like, God, is this the plan? Should I do this? Is this right? And many times we come before God and we try to get God to validate what we're already doing, the decisions that we've already made. Like, I've already made up my mind to do this, so God bless it. Make sure it's okay. Go back to verse 14, Joshua 9. It's the key to all of this, right? So the men took some of the provisions, but did not ask counsel from the Lord. One of the most important things that we can do in this life is to go to God and ask Him for help. Like, God, what are you saying? What do you want to do? What is the direction here? Um, God, give me strength in this moment. Give me guidance here through this situation. And it's an amazing thing that God has offered His people. The main reason that we don't take advantage of it, though, is because we are self-sufficient. We can do it on our own. We don't need anybody else's help. It looks right. It sounds right. It seems right. So I don't have to ask God. And here in Joshua 9, that's the big failure. And so what happens when we fail at this? Well, when you make a poor decision, you've got to act with integrity. When I make poor decisions, I need to act with integrity. Joshua's covenant with Gibeon wasn't this light, simple agreement. It was actually a covenant. It was like a vow. It was a promise that was made in the name of God Most High. And so going back on this covenant was a far graver mistake than just being deceived by these people and making this poor decision. The key here is to live with integrity. Do what is right. Sometimes that means reversing a decision stopping what we're doing at that moment and now because we now recognize that it's wrong and turn from that. I don't read in this story that we can never put things in reverse and change a poor decision. In fact, where it is possible, I think that is the very best option we have. But other times, it means that we've made a commitment, we've signed a contract, we've agreed to a deal, and we sticked with it, even if something better comes along. 
So we drove that old Lexus that we hated for a few years. <laughs> uh, next thing we do is we trust God to work things for the best. We've talked a lot about this as we've gone through Joshua, but I want to just say it again. We often have the idea that if we miss or if we disobey God's guidance at one point in our lives, that we'll be off track now and that we're just subject to God's plan B for the rest of our life. We feel like God had this wonderful plan for our lives, but we missed all the clues to go down that way, and so we're going to stagger about in misery for the rest of our lives and only know God's second best. I don't believe that to be true. I know people have made the wrong decision, and God has worked out and in, in, in through that decision in, in their lives. We see him faithful in that. See, God is there to redeem those decisions, to make something beautiful out of them, to continue to love and to restore and to bring blessing and wholeness even when we've made the wrong choice. And of course, God wants to guide us and direct us to make the best decisions in our lives and the best choices, but even when we don't do that, he is still with us, walking with us, and desiring to guide us in that situation. Now, there are difficult consequences when we make the wrong decision. That happens. We later realize that that wasn't the best choice, but that never means that God is going to abandon us, to give up on us. He continues to guide us in a new set of circumstances that we have in our lives. He continues to offer forgiveness and redemption. And sometimes that's the power to change and set things right. Sometimes that's the power to live with that decision that we've made in our lives. And sometimes something beautiful comes out of that. And that's what he wants to do, is to make something beautiful out of that. And so to end this morning, I want us just to notice in this story that we haven't really hit on too much yet, just the redemptive picture of Jesus in all of this whole story. Even though there's this redemptive picture and this scene here in this passage, we need to understand that the Israelites were not supposed to make this uh, alliance, this treaty with this group of people. But even though, even through that, there's this amazing redemptive picture and what we see here is a people who had no right to belong to the community of Israel. They were, they were sinners, they were evil, they were, they were not following God, they didn't even look to God. They were supposed to be destroyed because of their wickedness, and yet they are saved by Joshua. It's, the, it's got this amazing wording here, right? Joshua would save them from the hand of the Israelites, why word it like that except to give it this redemptive picture, this beautiful picture here? Here's God saving outsiders who needed rescue. They plead for rescue and God saves them. This is one of the greatest themes that we see in the Bible. And when we read about the Gibeonites and what they say and what they do, you know, it's, it's a lot about uh, similar to what Rahab had said. And Rahab was saved from Jericho from... Um, because of her words and all of her actions. And the Gibeonites should die under the wrath of God. That's us, right? We deserve that. We shouldn't belong. We should absolutely be destroyed because of our sins. Yet these people find salvation. These people are servants for the house of the Lord. What a picture here. It's a beautiful picture of God saving and rescuing people. Here he is again rescuing people. And this is what he wants to do. And this is what he has done through his other Joshua, Jesus, right? He has saved us, what we celebrated there this morning during communion. And that if we would trust in Jesus, not ourselves, we've got to get rid of that self-sufficiency we talked about here. If we would trust Jesus to be the Lord of our lives, to save us because we cannot save ourselves, we cannot be good enough, we need Jesus. If we would trust him we can be a part of that family, and we can follow him, and he can lead us in our lives. That's what this is about. Would you bow your heads this morning as we close? And I don't know where you are exactly in your life. <clears throat> Not everybody here. I do know that many of us may be in the middle in our lives right now. Things aren't where we want them to be exactly, and we're just kind of waiting for that next step. 
Maybe you've got decisions you need to make in your life and you're not sure what decision to make or maybe you, you, you've got this decision, everything looks right, feels right, sounds right, you're ready to jump on board, but you haven't asked God yet. Maybe today is the day that you ask God, God, what are you doing in this? How are you leading in this? What's the direction and path you have right now, God? So would you just take some time here and ask God that? Maybe today you need to trust God. Say, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to follow you with my life, Lord God. Whatever, it's, whatever you say, I know you are a God who loves and rescues, and so would you rescue me in this moment that I can walk with you and have peace with you. Maybe you've made a wrong decision. Would you trust today that God will make that right as you follow him? How is he leading you in this situation? So those are our options this morning. And as our musicians play, would you take those before God and prayer? You're welcome to come down to the altar and pray. You're welcome to pray at your seat. But would you just take some time to ask God those?